Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, how many of you have done some research at the Library of Congress? OK, do you guys know where the Library of Congress is? <laughs> OK, we're at a university, right? I'm glad to be at Marymount University today, right across the river from your nation's capital, where the Library of Congress is located. Um, and I will, during my talk, pepper you with fascinating facts about the library so that you will be so excited about being across the river from the library that tomorrow we will have a flood of you coming to the library to get your reader's cards because you'll be like, wow, I had no idea all of that fabulous stuff was so close by, okay? So part of it is, that's part of my objective tonight. But I really do appreciate the invitation to talk with students. And I really appreciated the opportunity to come by and watch some of your presentations this afternoon because I'd like to, to hear about areas that I know nothing about. I really enjoy attending sessions by young people to get a sense of how you're doing your research and what attracts your attention. And so that was a real treat for me. And, um, and it was great. I was jotting down some good notes, too, about some things I need to learn more about. So thank you for that. In the next 27 minutes or so, I intend to tell you some really terrific stories that are inspired by materials in the collections at the Library of Congress. And I'm going to preface what I have to say with this. I am a historian. I am an educator. I am a former high school teacher. I have been working for the federal government for about 20 years. And all of these things combined, what you need to know going into this is that when I'm telling stories about research, I have an expectation that you know a little something about history. And if you don't, you need to cry uncle, all right? You need to say, I don't have any idea who you're talking about. I have specifically chosen stories based on individuals that I kind of think you might have at least heard of. But if I'm way off, you need to tell me, OK? Promise? Yes. Yeah. All right. So our first story was inspired, and actually the title of my talk was inspired by this guy. His name is Igor Sikorsky. Does it ring any bells? OK, good. Tell me what bell it rang. Helicopters. Helicopters. OK, now are the rest of you thinking, oh, yeah, OK, I've heard of him. Immigration. All right, this is all good. All right, so Igor Sikorsky was born in Kiev, which at the time he was born there, it wasn't Ukraine yet. I mean, he was in present day Ukraine. He was born in Kiev in 1889. He emigrated to the United States in 1919. But when he was 12 years old, living back in the Ukraine, he had an opportunity to do some traveling and had a chance to see, and this is one of those, whether it was in a book, which is probably most likely the case, or whether it was in some sort of a museum exhibition, he saw a 15th century drawing that looked kind of like this. Anybody have any idea who might have drawn that? Yeah, how do you know? <laughs> yeah, because I put it on the title there, OK? Have you heard of him? OK. So Leonardo da Vinci is living in the 15th century, and he's drawing some things that Igor Sikorsky, as a 12-year-old living in Ukraine, sees and thinks, oh, wow, that's a cool idea. All right, so far so good? At 12, he creates a helicopter that works using rubber bands. It's a toy. And that toy helicopter that worked gave him a little bit of inspiration thinking maybe someday I really can make this work. OK, so far so good? Now this is where we get into the Library of Congress and the collections. So at the library, some of Igor Sikorsky's materials are in our manuscripts division. And this is a page from one of his notebooks. And I'm sorry that it's, you know, it's so bright. Maybe if I hit, can I hit this light? Is that going to throw anything off if I do that? Maybe. That doesn't really help here, though. Can I do anything with those lights? Maybe? In any case. All right, well, use your will. If you're really interested, after my talk, you can come up and look at it on the small screen. And you can see that it looks you know, kind of yellowing paper, which is pretty cool. So this notebook um, is dated December the 8th, 1930. And it's simply a page out of a notebook. You know, it's a journal that he's keeping. And up here, it says the helicopter transmission. Now, does anybody know anything about the history of helicopters? The first viable helicopter really does become invented by Igor Sikorsky, but not until 1939. So his notebook here from 
19, from 1930, nine years earlier, he's got a line that I just love. And he uses it repeatedly in his journal. And it says, consider a possibility of. And then he describes an idea that he's got. And if you go through his journals, repeatedly he uses that expression. Consider a possibility of. My husband is a flight test engineer. He's not a historian. When I told him that Igor Sikorsky's papers were at the library and he could get his hands on them, he got kind of excited. Um, and when he was thumbing through these pages, he was paying really close attention to the drawings and he was paying really close attention to these big ideas. I was paying really close attention to process. You know, how did these ideas come to pass? How did he record his ideas and so on? So the point of all of this is that that line, consider possibilities, and keeping in mind that Igor Sikorsky was considering possibilities long before his research ever really amounted to what it was he was working on, I hope serves as a great lesson when we're thinking about the value of the work that we do on a daily basis, that sometimes what we're working on right now, we don't see it to fruition for at least nine years, and sometimes a lot longer than that. Um, but that idea about considering possibilities, I thought, oh, he was on to something. Um, but he wasn't the only one. And I've got four stories that I do want to tell you that, um, that again, emphasize the notion of considering possibilities and the relationships between learning and knowledge and creativity and how the, the, those three come together to, um, to make some, some good um, research opportunities in your own minds. Um, as illustrated by Sikorsky's notebooks, when I said I worked at the Library of Congress and I asked how many of you have been there and I didn't get a whole lot of hands raised, can I just ask you out of curiosity, when you hear Library of Congress, what comes to your mind? <laughs> okay. Beautiful okay, all right, the architecture, yeah, it's a beautiful building. The Jefferson Building's extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Oh, not really, but what's that? OK, yeah, because you've been there. You've seen them, right? OK, but um, there's a tendency, if you say to somebody you work at a library, they assume you work with a whole bunch of books. And that's true. The library does have a huge book collection. In fact, it is the largest book collection of any library in the world. The library's general collection has about 158 million books. It's an extraordinary collection. but. Igor Sikorsky's papers aren't counted in that because his collections are part of the manuscript division. So in addition to the books at the library, the library contains extraordinary manuscript collections, extraordinary map collections. In fact, the largest map collection in the world is at the Library of Congress. The collections that are in film, and I know that some of you were doing your projects today on film, the motion picture and broadcast and recorded sound division at the library, the largest motion picture collection in the world. Um, there are collections of architectural drawings. There are prints and photographs. There are, I already talked about the maps. The collections come in every media imaginable. And they're very accessible. You guys are all over 16. You guys can all get a reader's card. You're all over 18. You can come do research in the manuscript division and in the rare book division as well as all of the other reading rooms. Extraordinary collections of newspapers. And just the other day, I learned that the library has the world's largest collection of comic books. I'm not sure we brag about that as much as we probably ought to, but in any case. OK, so, so that said, um, I love the manuscript division. I love, I love journals. I love letters. And the reason I think I love them is because they allow us to connect to people who came before us. And those human experiences have a lot to teach us. Alexander Graham Bell, you heard of him? Mm -hmm. What do you know about Alexander Graham Bell? Telephone. telephone. Anybody have any idea when the telephone was invented? 18, early 1870s, late 1870s. What do you think? Yeah, all right, all right, good. So the telephone is invented by Alexander Graham Bell, and he, in, in this letter, is from 1899. He's writing a letter to a guy named Guillermo Marconi. You ever heard of him? Radio, you ever heard of that? All right, usually Marconi's associated with being the inventor of radio, but there's a lot of argument about that. But nonetheless, we associate Marconi with the radio. We associate Alexander Graham Bell with the telephone, OK? In 1899, 
Marconi hasn't invented the radio yet. Okay, it's not until 1909 that he wins his Nobel Prize related to telegraphy, okay? He's 25 years old. He's taking a trip to North America. And Alexander Graham Bell finds out that he's coming and he sends him this letter. And the reason that we know we send him this letter is because the papers of Alexander Graham Bell are guess where? In the Library of Congress. And this is a carbon copy. You guys know what a carbon copy is? <laughs> Do you see where I'm going with this? I mean, there's a lot to historical knowledge, OK? All right. This is a carbon, it really is. It's a piece of very thin paper, and it is a carbon copy of the letter that Alexander Graham Bell sent to Marconi in September of 1899 after finding out that Marconi was going to be in North America. And basically, the letter says, I understand from reading the newspaper that you're in America, would love to have you over to the house to meet the wife. We're up in Nova Scotia for the summer. OK? The best part of the letter is down here. Remember, this is Alexander Graham Bell. Do you suppose that Marconi knew who Graham Bell was? Oh my gosh, yes, OK. Marconi gets this letter, and at the bottom of it says, remember, this is 1899. He says, I should be glad to have the opportunity of talking over with you the possibility of wireless telephony. 1899, anybody impressed yet? <laughs> I loved it, I loved it. And I have to say, this is pretty cool too, because did you know that every time I move, this moves? <laughs> and I'm just thinking, Marconi's loving this. <laughs> this is great, okay. And Graham Bell as well, and then it continues, and he says, um, and, oh, and you gotta remember, Marconi's 25. Alexander Graham Bell's like 52. He invented the telephone almost 30 years old earlier when he's only in his 20s. Marconi continues reading his letter. Let's talk about wireless telephones. And we'll um, be glad to meet you personally and shake you by the hand. Isn't that fabulous? Alexander Graham Bell wants to shake my hand. And Marconi hasn't even done anything yet, really. He's just experimenting. He's got some pretty nutty ideas. So Marconi, unfortunately, he never met because Marconi had to catch a boat to get to England. But he writes this handwritten little note um, on Hoffman House, Madison Square, New York, um, stationery. How many of you can still read cursive? <laughs> <laughs> this is another reason why I love manuscripts. It's like you've got this like secret code. I do this um, with my kids all the time. My, my son's 15, my daughter is 12. And it's kind of a joke at our house why it's so important to have good handwriting. It's so that you can read these awesome letters. Um, so Marconi writes this letter to Professor Alexander Graham Bell. And he basically explains, I'm so sorry, I can't meet you. And I'm sure he was really disappointed. I mean, think about it. The chance to meet Alexander Graham Bell, and, you, and you have to, you've, got your, you've got plans. But he says up here, thanking you again um, for your invitation. And he's acknowledging in the beginning of the letter about how sorry he is and how much he admires Alexander Graham Bell. So you've got this really neat exchange where, unfortunately, they don't meet. But this connection between these two begins a really interesting exploration of some ideas about connections as we're doing our research. While you guys were doing your research, did you come across any pretty interesting people? I hope. You're kind of nodding your heads. All right. They don't have to be cool historic people, by the way. All right, so far so good. Because I'm going to, at the end of this, the teacher in me is going to have to ask you questions about each story and what they each say about learning and creativity and knowledge, OK? All right, next one. Can you see the letterhead well enough? It's kind of, sort of. OK, tell me about the letterhead. Yeah. It's the Wright Cycling Company in Dayton, Ohio. And the letter is dated May 1900. So it's really just about six months, well, let's think, three, five, eight months after the Bell and Marconi exchange. All right, so roughly the same time period. And this letter, um, so we know it's coming from one of the Wright brothers. It's actually Wilbur Wright who's writing the letter. And, um, and he's writing to a Mr. Octave Chanute. Does anybody know who Octave Chanute was? Yeah, exactly. He, too, was an aviation pioneer, OK? And this is a five-page letter 
that Wilbur Wright is writing to Octave Chanute. And in this section, um, I'm going to, it's hard, it is hard for me to read on this screen, and I do have it here, so I'm going to read you word for word what he says. He says, um, he says, for some years, I have been afflicted with the belief that flight is possible to man. My disease has increased in severity, and I feel it will soon cost me an increased amount of money, if not my life. I have been trying to arrange my affairs in such a way that I can devote my entire time for a few months to experiment in this field. All right, this is May of 1900. And Wilbur Wright is afflicted with this notion that something that he really wants to commit some time to is possible. How many of you felt that way during your research? You were afflicted knowing that the possibility was out there. OK, later in the letter, he continues. And he emphatically states his belief that man flight was attainable. And this is what he says. He says, it is possible. Remember, what, do you guys know when, the, when we actually, when he's successful in flying? Yes. When's that? Yes, three years later. So they haven't done it yet. Nobody has flown successfully quite yet. He says, um, it is possible to fly without motors, but not without knowledge and skill, he explained. And then he further declared that flight pioneers needed to share their insights and their successes. And finally, he says, the problem is too great for one man alone and unaided to solve in secret. Isn't that great? Aren't you inspired? Well, that's a very, very tactful objective. Isn't Nobody it? Method of the other that's exactly what he does. And that's exactly what he does later in the letter. He's asking him for his idea, for Chanute's ideas on, do you know any place where there's good winds? <laughs> I understand. I understand North Carolina sand dunes are pretty good. What do you know about them? But it's a marvelous exchange. But the thing that's so interesting is that Octave Chanute, actually, when he's writing the letter, Chanute was a little further along in some ways than the Wright brothers were. Um, but that notion that they really needed to work together and the idea that the problem was solvable and the only way it was going to be solved was if they worked together. Great story, huh? Mm -hmm. Makes you want to do some digging into the Wright brothers papers, doesn't it? <laughs> Guess where they are? <laughs> That's right. They're at the Library of Congress. But, but I also need to say that the Octave Chanute papers are really, really the reason why the library has such a wealth of information about the Wright brothers. Because the Wright brothers didn't save as much stuff as Chanute did. And so researchers really owe a debt of gratitude to Octave Chanute for our understanding of the Wright brothers. That's pretty cool, too, especially when you're thinking about your own research. Where is your information coming from? All right. You guys love aviation, right? So we're going to move on. And, um, and instead, I'm going to tell you a story about Thomas Jefferson. Um, this, is not a, uh, this is not an aviation story. Um, the, um, I got to tell you a Thomas Jefferson story. Oh, I'm good on time. OK, so I work at the Library of Congress. And I don't think it's possible for someone to work at the library come and speak to anyone without talking a little bit about Thomas Jefferson, OK? The reason is because the present day Library of Congress really began as Thomas Jefferson's collection. And I say that with a little caveat, OK? In 1800, when Congress moves to Washington, DC from New York, you guys know that story, right? All right, they're all nodding their heads. This is good. Um, Congress passes legislation to create a library for Congress. That first Library of Congress was primarily a collection of law books. And those law books were intended to guide lawmakers in the Capitol. The very first Library of Congress was in the Capitol building. During the War of 1812, what happened to Washington? Yeah, in June of, 19, of 1814, the Capitol is burned. And there are some historians who believe that the fire was actually started in the Capitol in the libraries, you know, law books burn well, I guess. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they do. Maybe they do. Um, Jefferson is living at his home down at Monticello at the time. He hears what happens, and he makes he extends an offer to Congress, and he says, "I'm willing to sell you my library." And the reason that's significant is because Thomas Jefferson had 
the largest personal library in North America when he made that offer. He owned more than 6,000 volumes, and offering to Congress to, uh, to purchase them was going to help out both, because how much do you know about Jefferson? He owed money on money. Boy, did he. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He needed a little cash. The thing is, though, the deal he made with Congress was a really good one for the American people, because Thomas Jefferson sold his library to Congress for roughly $4 a volume. And some of his books, even back then, were worth more than $100. So he really did make, I mean, Congress did a, they made a good deal <laughs> getting the library. But can you imagine, Congress actually argued about whether or not to buy Jefferson's library. <laughs> Giggle, of course they argued, they're Congress. Um, the, um, but the argument's an interesting one. There were some who said, we don't need Thomas Jefferson's library, we just need his law books. You know, Jefferson's library wasn't just books about law. Thomas Jefferson's li John, he was a Renaissance man. He was interested in astronomy. He was interested in growing grapes. He was interested in botany. He had books in languages other than English. There were many in Congress who said, you know what, we don't need all that. And the argument that won is a really important one, especially to, to those of us who really care about the relationship between our Congress and a well-informed electorate. Thomas Jefferson's argue, the argument that won, that made Thomas Jefferson's library become the Library of Congress was, was a universalist argument that anything that the American people could be interested in, our elected officials should know something about. That's a really important argument. And that continues to affect the way the library's collections grow to this day. Guess how many different languages are represented in the library today? By the way, Jefferson had books in seven different languages. Guess how many different languages are at the library today? At least 150. You're right. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. That's a perfect question. Yeah, because what I'm going to say, you're going to be like, I didn't even know there were that many. 470-ish different languages are represented in the collections. And you know, some of those languages are no longer spoken. Some of those languages, I mean, they're really, it's again, Thomas Jefferson had a marvelous influence on this library that we all have access to, and you're all going to go get your reader's cards because you're really, really curious to know more about Thomas Jefferson, right? Guess where his papers are? The library of Congress, along with the presidential papers, with papers of the first 23 presidents. So Thomas Jefferson, as we know, was the third president of the United States. We know he was the first Secretary of State. We know a lot of things about Thomas Jefferson. Um, how many of you knew that Thomas Jefferson really liked science? Good. What else do you know about Jefferson? Anything? He was a Virginian. Come on. You guys are all supposed to know stuff about Jefferson. Well, I'm going to tell you a little. I'm going to. This is the warrants a little bit more background as well. Um, one of the things that my team and I at the library do. We work primary, primarily with classroom teachers. And our job is to alert teachers to the online resources of the library like these and encourage them to incorporate them into their instruction so that kids understand that the problems we're trying to solve today are not unique to us. And that the more we learn from the past, the more successful, frankly, we will be. The, um, so we write articles for journals for journals like that of the National Council for the Social Studies and the National Science Teachers Association and so forth. Well, the NCSS journal, we write a column that's regular. It's called Sources and Strategies. And sometimes the editor will tell us what the theme of the magazine is and encourage us to write something in keeping with the theme so that the whole issue you know, kind of flows. Well, the September issue of last year was going to have a constitutional focus. And we were thinking, what can we write about the Constitution that might be a different story than the story we all think we know about the framework and what happened in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787 and so forth. So we started poking around in the Jefferson Papers. And what I found had nothing to do with what I thought I was going to find. Now, Jefferson was not at the, Constitu the Constitutional Convention. And I knew that. And that was the story I kind of wanted to tell was, what was he doing? And was he somehow influencing what was going on in Philadelphia from afar? Or you know, what, what might be the interesting story there? Um, 
when I started poking around his papers around September 17th, what I found was that not only was September 17th a significant date in terms of the history of the Constitution, but it was a significant date in terms of, I don't know if we call it earth science or astronomy or, I'm not sure, but there was an eclipse. There was a total eclipse of the sun on September the 17th, but in the year 1821. I thought, oh, well, that's kind of cool. I wonder if there's a story there. And so I did a little bit more digging into Jefferson's papers to find out what was it about this eclipse that he was so interested in? So you know what this story is really related to. And this is how you think you're doing research on one thing, but you get totally sidetracked. <laughs> By the way, we didn't write an article about Jefferson and the Constitution. I ended up finding colonial currency that was a fabulous way of talking about the economy at the time of the Constitution. So we featured the currency instead of a Jefferson story. But the Jefferson story, I save for you. So I'm going to tell you the Jefferson story. Um, so, um, OK, so, uh, and I had my date wrong. It wasn't 1821. It was 1811. So on Constitution Day, September 17, 1811, two years after Jefferson had left the White House, he's in his late 60s, there was a solar eclipse. And he's interested, this is so fabulous, in how the eclipse might help him calculate the exact longitude of his home at Monticello. Because we all want to know that, right? <laughs> Love this guy. So he exchanges letters with a man named William Lambert. And Lambert is an astronomer from Virginia with whom Jefferson first became acquainted in the early 1790s when Lambert was a State Department clerk. Remember, Jefferson had been the Secretary of State, so this guy's working under him. And they start, I guess, over the coffee talking about astronomy. Um, and this is, again, and I have, and this is another, you know, you're doing research and then you stumble on these things, but you have to tell the whole story. So Lambert also served as the principal clerk of the House of Representatives for many, many years, but he resigned in 1809 in order to make calculations intended to fix an American first meridian in Washington because he believed that American ships having to navigate by the prime meridian was a form of unnecessary allegiance to Great Britain. <laughs> Isn't that fat? I mean, these things, I've never heard of this guy. And here's a great story. And there's great stuff on William Lambert and his attempt to, you know, eliminate the prime meridian. But um, anyway, Lambert's letters to Jefferson about this eclipse are filled with pages and pages of complex mathematical calculations. So this is just one of many letters. And there's a whole lot of math in them. And I found myself thinking, oh, we should tell math teachers about these records and let them help us explain what exactly is going on in these calculations, because this could be pretty interesting. Um, I knew that Jefferson was an amazing writer. I knew he was interested in so many things. I didn't know that he had such command of mathematics. And that's where I got a real kick out of the rest of these letters, because he didn't. <laughs> and there's something kind of fabulous about that, you know, where you, you, know, you think you know someone, and then you find out something about them, and you think, wow, OK, so they weren't perfect. This is good. Well, this is what he says to Lambert in, um, in, um, in one of his letters. Um, he says, OK, so this is Lambert's letter to Jefferson. OK, this is like page one of multiple pages with all the calculations. And I'm like, wow, I can't believe he could make sense of all of this. How, I mean, this is really incredible. He's, Lambert's in Washington. He sees the eclipse. He's trying to figure out the angle of the light in relation. I mean, it's, it's serious, cool math to come up with a longitude answer. This is Jefferson's letter back to Lambert. And he says, um, He's, this is word for word what Jefferson says. Now, you see, we're going to pretend it's 1811, and this English makes perfect sense to us, OK? He says, I am very thankful for your calculations on my observations of the late solar eclipse. I have, for some time past, been rubbing off the rust of my mathematics contracted during the 50 years engrossed by other pursuits. That's bad. He's like, ah, I've been a little busy for 50 years, but I'm having fun with this math. Um, and I have found in it a delight and a success beyond my expectations. So here he is in his 60s, realizing he's forgotten a lot of math, but he's ready to learn it again. I observed the eclipse of the sun with a view to calculate my longitude from it. 
But other occupations had prevented my undertaking it before my journey, and the calculations you have furnished me with show it would have been more elaborate than I had expected, and that most probably I should have foundered by the way. I love that. Humility. Jefferson. Yeah. OK. Um, so um, let me pause there for a minute. So back to the beginning, where I was talking about learning, knowledge, and creativity. You guys tell me about the Bell Marconi Exchange. What do those, the letter, you know, the letter from Bell to Marconi and the response back, what, do, what does that relationship tell you about either learning, creativity, or knowledge, or all three? Okay, yeah, there's, there's a message about sharing ideas, I think. What do you think? Yeah, excellent. Doesn't always have to happen now. Good, yeah. Kind of be cool if we had wireless telephones in the 1890s, but yeah. Ah, nice. Okay, it teaches something else about communication, certainly. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that notion of a role model. You know, I bet. And what's really neat about that exchange and how polite they are to each other, you really get a sense that Alexander Graham Bell really believed he could learn something from this young whippersnapper. And Marconi had a tremendous amount of respect back to Bell. So there's something about role models and who we can learn from. That's, and it doesn't have to be you know, a young person learning from an older person. OK? I think you're right. All right, how about the Octave Chanute and the, uh, the Wilbur Wright exchange? Any thoughts on what we might learn about learning and creativity there? Knowledge. Remember what he said about it, flight, unman or excuse me, um, that motorized flight was possible, but what did it require? Well, I think he said without engines, but not without knowledge and study. Yeah, and yeah, he said learning. without knowledge and skill. He's talking about I mean, what does it really take to make something happen? And I, I think that quote applies to an awful lot of things. Okay, and then in the Lambert and Jefferson exchange, what do we what what do we what can we glean? Perfect. See, I love that. That is such good advice. It's great. Exactly. And how about you don't have to know everything, but how awesome is it to realize that you can continue learning things or that maybe something you were interested in when you were younger might actually come back to you as you're older and it's worth pursuing. I think there's something to that. And of course, with the Sikorsky story, I just love this. I, any story about tenacity is a good one, and there's a good one. You know, he had this idea starting when he's 12 years old, and it's many, many, many years later, and all along he's keeping track of what possibilities might exist. Great story. Okay, but I said I had four stories, so my last one is a guy named Herbert Putnam. You ever heard of this guy? <laughs> I was going to worry about you, by the way, if you did. No, it isn't. It isn't. Somebody told I, 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 it's so funny. I looked up Putnam's name once, and I found a bunch of library ladders, like those rolling library ladders from old libraries. But it's not him. But I thought it could be because Herbert Putnam was once upon a time the librarian of Congress. And he served for an extremely long period of time from the late um, 1800s into the early 1900s. And early in his tenure as librarian of Congress, he was invited to speak to a group of librarians in Iowa. And in his papers that are, guess where? <laughs> At the Library of Congress. And by the way, his scrapbooks are really cool because he knew everybody. And so any, any interesting person that lived in the DC area between like the 1890s and the 1930s, He's got cards and letters and photographs and all kinds of stuff from it. It's pretty good. So, I mean, birth announcements and stuff. It's great. Um, but in the Putnam Papers, there are copies of speeches. And in this one speech that he gave to Iowa librarians, um, he talks about scholars. And, and he talks about the relationship that the Library of Congress ought to play in scholarship. And he says something that I just, oh, I just love. He describes the Library of Congress as, but it is not a library merely for scholars already made. It is a library for scholars 
in the making, just like you guys, scholars in the making. Um, it's fun to think about how, you know, as you say, you know, right now you're students and you describe yourselves as students, but you are so much more than students. You are whatever it is you will ultimately be sitting in these chairs right now. You know, you are, you are physical therapists in the making. You are filmmakers in the making. You are psychologists and sociologists and your, your brilliant data miner types. I don't even know what to call those, but Marconi probably had an idea. Um, and all of those things that you are in the making to become are being formed right now as you're doing your research. And it is my hope that as you are doing your research and experiencing what it means to make connections to other people and to content and to knowledge and to creativity, that you will keep in mind that, frankly, beyond the content that your research uncovers, these are the things that really matter. And these are the things that I feel very strongly um, come out of working with these fabulous manuscript collections. So I hope that you will learn to admire others and celebrate creativity and recognize inspiration and be passionate and tenacious and seek knowledge and skills, but be humble and collaborate and respect differing opinions and engage in civil discourse and find joy in problem solving, just like Da Vinci and Sikorsky and Marconi and Bell and Wright and Chanute and Jefferson did. And that's my talk. <laughs>